All right, so I'm gonna do some housekeeping things before I turn this over to Laura. I wanna welcome everybody tonight for our college financial aid webinar. Thank you so much for coming. We have a lot of people here tonight visiting us. And um, I wanted to let you know that this is not a meeting format on Zoom, it's a webinar. So if you've never done this before, it means that we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. You don't need to worry about a mute button. Somebody asked that already. Um, we can't hear anything that's happening in the background, kids running around, anything. Um, but you can see us as the panel. We also don't do questions during the course of the program by raising hands. In fact, I'm gonna ask everybody not to raise their hands because I won't be able to field that. But we do have a Q&A section where you can type your questions in and we're gonna leave a lot of time towards the end of this so that you can ask questions and we'll be fielding them with our guests tonight so that they can answer those questions. So I wanna thank you all for being here. And I'll also tell you that this is being recorded and the recording will be available up on the district website within the next week. It will be under the workshop archives section of the website and anything that uh, resources that we're given during this, I'll also put links for it up on that page. So that's about it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Jake. And good evening, Simi Valley Unified. We are happy that you are all here with us tonight. Nothing better on a rainy day than to talk about financial aid. So that's what we're going to get to. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our guest speaker um, tonight, um, Anaisa Alonzo. She's a financial aid specialist from Moore Park College. And of course, we have um, our other college and career counselors here, um, Alfonso Ruiz from Simi Valley High School and Haley Estrada from Santa Susana High School. So, and I'm Laura Cuneo from Royal High School. And again, we're all happy to have you here. Um, Anais is gonna go through, um, you know, the um, some tips, some reminders, um, and some general information about how to fill out the FAFSA form, which is the free application for federal student aid. Um, this is primarily going to be most applicable to our seniors, of course, but this is open to all grade levels for those of you that are curious about what goes into a financial aid application and just general information. And as many of you may know, the, the FAFSA was recently revamped and it is still undergoing some changes. So uh, we're going to hear tonight um, what those changes were so you guys can all be prepared. So Anaisa, thank you for being here. Go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you so much for having me. And I do apologize, I'm not feeling the best. So I am sound a little off today. But what I'm going to go through first is I'm going to share my screen to show you guys what the FAFSA for the current academic year that for students who are going to start in college in August, which should be the seniors, what it's looking like now. Um, so is there any way that uh, Jake, if you can um, let me share my screen? <coughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, it should be open for you. Okay, awesome. Okay, let me know. What, all right, so currently, this is basically the PDF version of the FAFSA application that you will see when you go in, when you and your student go in to do the actual application. So um, this is just kind of how to fill it out. Let me get to here. Okay, so... Before the students can do their FAFSA application, both student and parents need to do what's called an FSA ID. The FSA ID is basically your username and password, your signature to sign the FAFSA application. Now, um, students, they cannot use their high school uh, email. So like any, if they have a Royal High School a one, if they have a Simi High School email, they can't use that. They have to use their own personal email because once they graduate, they're going to be cut off from that email. Parents, you also need to create um, an FSA ID. Only one parent needs to do it. But parents, you have to have a different email than your student. So you both cannot have the same email. So it has to be different emails, different phone numbers, because those are two items that is going to get verified for the students to be able to create this FSA ID. Now, if a student is a US citizen and a, or a permanent resident, but one but both of their parents are not, 
We still are going to need the parents to create an FSA ID using their ITIN number. Now, right now, um, the FAST application is having a really hard time uh, getting that set up. So that's kind of putting a hold on students in those particular situations where the student is either a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, but both of the parents are not. So unfortunately, at this moment, there's no workaround for that. So it's kind of for those students are going to have to kind of be put on a on a holding pattern until FAFSA has been able to figure out that caveat. So once your FSA, the student's FSA ID is completed, it's going to bring them to this page right here that asks them for their personal information, their mailing address. And then it's this is the part that actually gets a lot of people confused. It it do, even though it does say it's students' current mar marital status, okay, not the parents. Please make sure you're reading the instructions because it does ask specifically for students. Because if you put that the student is married, that's going to make the student quote unquote independent, and then that's going to give them an invalid financial aid package to the point where they may owe money back in the future. And it has happened to quite a few students where the you know it was filled out. They put married, even though they meant the parent was married, and all of a sudden now they're owing back five, six thousand dollars. So please be mindful when you're filling it out that everybody is reading the question of whose marital status it's asking. The next question it's going to ask you is what is their uh, what is their uh, program a year in college? Obviously, everybody's going to pick first year even if you were in a even if the student was a dual enrollment student it's still a first year student <clears throat> the next question is do they have a bachelor's degree make sure you click no because no students graduating high school will have a bachelor's degree if you click yes that then disqualifies them from getting any type of financial aid this next part section five student personal circumstances this is the student. Basically, does any of these situations apply to the student? Are they a veteran? You know, do they have children that they personally support that are in their household, meaning that they, that, that they the student, financially support? There is a question here that says that any time since the student turned 13, were they an orphan, basically no biological parents or adoptive parents living? Okay. At any time since the student turned 13, were they awarded the court or fo in foster care? So let's say a student, this one also trumps up a lot of people. Let's say a student was in foster care at 13, but then legally adopted at 14. They still would answer yes, that they were in foster care at 13, even though they are now adopted. Let's say they were in foster care at age three and adopted at age four or five then no, you're, got, you're, you're not going to check this box, okay? So because it, it's specifically with that age limit. Then on this, the, the next section, it's going to ask, are, was the student homeless at any time during, um, before, on or after July 1st, 2023? It's going to ask, was they, were they homeless as deemed by their school district, by a homeless shelter, by... Um, a financial aid specialist. Um, that's what it's going to ask. The next question, this is what we call unusual circumstances. So let's say the student technically answers no to all those questions. But let's say parents that the parents that they live with are alcoholics or drug addicts or physically and verbally or mentally abusive. Um, and at that point, it would obviously be a danger for the student to um, put their parent, contact their parent to put their parental information on there. Are their parents incarcerated? Um, did both parents decide, hey, you're 18, I'm kicking you out of the house and they changed the locks. So this is basically, question seven is basically unusual circumstances where it'd be dangerous, unsafe, or not feasible because maybe they don't know where they're at for the student to contact their parent and have the parent put information on the FAFSA. This is the only time when a student who would normally be dependent would be con would be possibly considered as an independent student. And then they would have to follow up with whatever financial aid office um, at, the at the school that they are thinking of going to, they would have to follow up with that office. 
Now, let's say that these parents, they they still, you know, that the let's say the kid is 18 and parents decide, hey, you're 18. They don't kick them out. They can still live with their parents. They still live at home. They still have contact. But the parents just say, I don't want to give you any financial aid. The only option available to these students is an unsubsidized loan. Now, that's what Section 8 is, is do they do they only want to apply for an unsubsidized loan? What this is basically saying is that my parent is just refusing to give the information so that I could qualify for possibly grants and fee waivers. Okay, we obviously want to make sure to usually hit no on this matter because it is obviously in the student's best interest to get parental information to put on the FAFSA application to see if they could qualify for fee waivers, um, like the free tuition, as well as um, grants, which is free money that they don't have to pay back that can be used to apply for books, supplies, transportation, housing, food, anything like that. Now, the next question is going to be family size, okay? Um, this is going to be, uh, sorry, wrong section. That's for independent students. Now, it's going to ask students their um, their demographic information in the sense of race and ethnicity. They don't have to apply. They don't have to respond to this if they don't want to. So there's always a section of prefer not to apply, not to answer. So you don't have to answer. You don't have to disclose if you don't feel comfortable. Okay. The next section is for student citizenship, section 13. Are they a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen? If you're an eligible non-citizen, meaning you're a per permanent resident, a refugee, or an asylee, you will have an A number, so you're going to have to provide that on the application. Okay? Now, if you're neither a U.S. citizen nor eligible non-citizen, then we're doing the wrong application. That would then require you to do uh, the student to do the California Dream application, which I will touch on. It's pretty much a carbon copy of what this is. Pretty much almost exactly. Now, student state of legal residence. That means when did the student become a resident of California? If they were born in California and have never moved, that's going to be the month and year they were born. Okay. It does ask for parents' educational status. I think this is this is most likely used for four-year colleges where they have additional uh, institutional aid. It doesn't make a difference at a community college what they answer. You can always put don't know. Again, is a, was a parent killed in the in the line of duty? Again, that's also used for institutional aid at four-year colleges. Now, right now, when a stu when the students are filling out this FAFSA form. It's asking what is their high school completion status. Make sure um, when you and your student are filling it out, you're assuming that the student will graduate. So you're going to select high school diploma. Okay, even though they don't technically have it right now, you still want to hit that button that yes, they will have a high school diploma when they start in August. Okay, it's going to then ask them for their high school name and the city and state. <clears throat> and... um then it's going to ask, you know, do you do you have a high school diploma or a GED? Now, if you have none of these, if you end up saying none of the previous, then you're going, basically, that's also disqualifying you from getting financial aid. So please make sure you're reading to get the, select the correct answer. Now, 18. This one is if anybody in the student or anyone in the student's family received anything like federal housing assistance, earned income credits, SNAP, TANF, WIC. So, you know, maybe the student's parents got WIC or got SNAP or got SSI. They would just be filling up the, those. They would just click whichever button uh, that associates with them. Now, when... You're filling in the tax information. The way FAFSA works, it works on prior, prior year. So right now, for the 24-25 academic school year, they're using 2022 income for both student and parent. So they're going to ask first, did the student, uh, did the student, um, basically you, the first question you want to ask yourself, did the student work in 2022? If not, then everything's going to be no. Now, if they did work, it's going to say, did they file a 1040 form? Okay. Now, they may not have, they may have worked, but may not have made enough money to file. So you have to make sure you're just, did, 
did they work? Did they file the taxes? If they didn't, you're going to put no. And then it's asking, did they earn income in a foreign country? Yes or no. Okay. Now, if they did file taxes, then it's going to ask for students' tax information, their filing status, how much money they earned from um, working, you know, income earned from work. All of that usually is going to get pulled from the IRS, but we always recommend that you guys have your taxes on, on hand because there's some questions that aren't going to be pulled from the IRS. Okay. Now, the next one it asks is for the student, did the student have any cash or savings? This is combined. You can ballpark it. It doesn't have to be exact. Then it asks, does the student have any net worth or investments, um, any businesses, things like that, stocks, bonds? Those are usually zero for high school students. Now, it doesn't show on here on this PDF, but in the middle of here, it's going to ask the student to put parent information. So it's going to ask, are parents married? Yes or no. If they are, it's going to require them to put both parents' information, their name, dates, the social security number of the parent, and the email. And then it's going to re tell the student to send a link to the parent inviting them to go in, click on their special link to go in and fill out their section of the FAFSA, which is going to be the tax information. Okay, so it's not shown exactly on this PDF, but that is going to be usually there between did the student file and then the next section, which is where they can put their colleges. Anais, yes. um, I've got our interpreters here. Okay. So um, Betsy's going to recite what the call in line is for the interpretation services. Anybody who is Spanish speaking and needs that, um, please listen. Betsy, are you ready? I'm ready. Buenas noches a todos. Soy Betsy Camacho. Gracias por acompañarnos esta noche. Tenemos una línea puente en donde ustedes podrán escuchar en español. Por favor, marquen al 805-306-4500, extensión 4298. Una vez que estén allí, les van a entrar, el, les van a pedir el código de acceso que es el 2258. Una vez más, 306 4500, extensión 4298. Y la, el código es 2258. Lo voy a estar poniendo en el chat pa, eh, eh, tem, varias veces para que ustedes puedan tener acceso a esa línea. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Ready. Okay, so one of the, um, another one of the updates that um, FAFSA did is in the past, students only had the option of putting 10 schools on their FAFSA application. Now it does increase it to 20, okay? Um, it doesn't matter the order that they put it in. It doesn't matter, you know, what, if they're just not sure, they can put up to 20 colleges of where this FAFSA application is going to go to, okay? Now, if they have more, which I really hope they don't, I really hope they've narrowed it down to, you know, at least 20 or less, they can always wait till this makes, till this processes, which is three business days. And then they can go in and make a correction to delete a school off. It won't, it won't take that FAFSA away from that school. It'll just make space for new schools. Okay. Now, uh, this section is if a student is married, so we're going to kind of bypass that. So here is the parental information that it's going to ask for you guys, okay? It's going to ask for your demographic, first name, middle, last. Now, it's going to ask, and this is for both students as well, your last name as it appears on your social security card, okay? Now, um, I know with, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Hispanic, so I do know a lot with a lot of, you know, Hispanic uh, people, we have multiple last names. It has to be the last name that's on your social security card, okay? Not the one that you maybe use more. So just make sure that you are putting in or you're telling your student when the student puts in the information to invite you um, to put in, you know, if it's two last names, put in both last names, okay? Because it's also going to, it has to match whatever's on the social security um, card, whatever's at the social security administration, all right? So. It's going to ask for social security number or the ITIN number if both parents do not have socials. And again, 
Um, right now, they're in the process of trying to fix this. There, there's no workaround right now. So if both parents don't have a social, um, then we're kind of in a holding pattern for those students. It's going to ask for parents' mobile phone, email address, their permanent address, so wherever you guys live. And then here is basically almost a carbon copy of what the, the student site is. It's going to say parent current marital status, parents legal state of residence. Okay. Now it's going to ask how many people are in the parent household. So this includes children that the parents are supporting. If Even if one of those child, let's say you have another child, you know, at the university of Oregon, um, and that child is 21. You're still technic. You're on that student's FAFSA. You're still technically supporting that student. So you would include them in that household, even though they're not physically in your household a lot of time of the year. You're going to include that that child. You're going to include any um, any people who live in your household that you um, financially support more than 50%. So let's say you have elderly parents living with you and you're basically supporting them. You have a siblings who live with you that you're supporting. Okay. This is not going to count as foster, any foster children that you have. You cannot count a foster child that's in your household. Okay. But it's asking everybody you support financially more than 50%. Then it's going to ask how many people are in college of that household do not include you yourself or your spouse so let's say both parents are in college and they have two other kids in college so don't put four in college put two because we cannot count the parents in college on this section okay and it's going to ask again did anybody from the family receive tanf snap wic earned income credit federal housing any of these it's going to ask again um, just in you know, in case the student missed it, it's going to ask the parents again to verify it. Now it's going to ask if the parents filed taxes, and then again, did you file a Puerto Rican return or a U.S. return? There's also a will file return. So if you have an extension for 2022, most of those extensions should be up by now, but there are still some that have an extension. Um, you would select will file, and then you would do your best to estimate the taxes, taxes paid. Um, there's also the, por the part where the parent did not and will not file a, ta a, a U.S. tax return. So there's different options. You have to pick the one that best suits your situation. Okay. Then the next part is, again, putting in parent tax information. This should pull mostly from the IRS, but it is going to still ask you information from your tax return. So I recommend you having your physical copy with you while you're filling out this application. Okay. Now, it's going to ask any child support that you received. Okay. So there's two questions on here. Uh, there's child support paid and child support received. Make sure they're both not filled in because you can't both receive and pay it at the same time, okay? You're either going to receive it or you're going to pay it. It's just one or the other. Now here on section 41, that's where the parent with their FSA ID, your username and password, that's where you're going to enter your username and password and hit sign and submit, and you have signed and submitted your section, okay? Um, and then here is also the, the, the second parent information. OK, so you if you have two parents, they're either ma legally married or they're um, unmarried, but living together and they're your bi and they're the biological parents of the student. It's going to have two sections, one for each parent. And again, it's the same information. OK, now, if parents have are div if biological parents are divorced and the, the student lives let's say primarily with mom and mom got remarried it has to be mom and stepdad's information on the fafsa okay now if parents are divorced and they literally share 50 50 custody split right down the middle evenly then you guys can pick whichever parent to put the in to put information on the fafsa okay now you shouldn't you this prepare information, you're going to leave that blank. You won't have a preparer. It's either going to be yourselves or like one of us who can help you fill it out. Um, And then 
we're not you're not gonna have to worry about mailing the information because it's gonna be submitted all online. Okay. So that is basically the FAFSA form in a nutshell. It's pretty much the same thing with the California Dream application, um, which is what I'm gonna go through quickly um here. Um so this web grants for students, this is where the students who are California Dream Application students here either they can be on DACA, they don't have to be on DACA um, to qualify for the Dream application. Um, they would uh, create their account strictly through um, the Web Grants for Students account. Um, this is a little bit of an old uh, screenshot because it doesn't have the, the COVID-19 update anymore on there. But basically, they're going to be entering the same information except without socials. Okay, tax information is going to be the same. It's going to ask them again if there's unusual circumstance. And then there's going to be a separate link for parents to go in and sign. They're also going to create a username and password for parents to sign the dream application. Now, right now, there is um, a California priority deadline is April 2nd. And what that means is that's for the um, Cal grant. Okay. It doesn't mean that you can't do a FAFSA after April 2nd. It's just that we want you guys to submit the FAFSA by April 2nd so that we can go, so that the California Student Aid Commission ha can award students for the uh, Cal grant, okay? And I'm going to show you what type of aid students can get, type of free money. Now, there's two types of fee waivers. If a student is going to come to a community college, whether it be Moore Park, Oxnard, Ventura, Pierce, you know, Mission College, um, there's the California Promise Grant, which is a need-based tuition fee waiver that waives the tuition costs, and that has no unit minimum. You can take half a unit and still qualify for this Promise Grant, which would waive the tuition costs. There's also... Um, called for us at Moore Park here, it's called the Moore Park Promise. That basically means a student still needs to do a FAFSA, but they would have to not qualify for FAFSA to, in order to qualify for the um, Moore Park Promise, and they would have to be taking 12 units or more. So that one does have a unit minimum, okay? It has to be 12 units or more. And the 12 units would have to be, Let's say if they're coming to Moore Park, they would have to be 12 units at Moore Park. If they're going to Oxnard, 12 units at Oxnard. If they're going to Ventura, same thing. Now, this year, the federal Pell Grant is $73.95 for a year. Usually, the Pell Grant does increase little by little each year. So that's what it is for this um, for the current year that we're in right now. It could go up by the time August rolls around. There is also a small supplemental grant for $500 that does increase to, I believe, $4,000 if they go to a four-year. Now, the Cal Grants. A Cal Grant A can be up to $12,570 at a UC, CSU, or a private university, as long as it's in California, okay? Now, if it's a Cal Grant B, it's going to be $1,648 at a community college, or a Cal Grant C, which is for um, uh, which is for a students who are taking technical classes. Think think like computer network, you know, computer network science. Okay, I do see a hand, Yvonne. Yes, this is the uh, interpreter, Yvonne Hi. Carrion, and I we have a we have a question in the chat where it says, "Is this uh, scholarship FAFSA also?" Uh, available without a social security. Would you explain that again, please? Yes. Okay. So the FAFSA application is only for students who have a social security or a per or um is for students who only are a US citizen or a permanent resident. Um they still can get like they can still get a Cal grant and the fee waiver um if the if the student does not have um a permanent resident or is not a U.S. citizen, they could still qualify for the fee waiver and the Cal grant through the DREAM application. They just wouldn't get the Pell grant or federal loans. That's the only thing they would not get. But for as far as doing the FAFSA, the student does need a social security card that is not for work permits all per, per, uh, purposes only. It would have to be a regular social security. Okay. 
Now, other financial aid available, this is for students who do who are eligible for the FAFSA. It's called the Federal Work Study Program. That's basically where you would work on campus in a department. Like I was a work study. I actually worked in the financial depart financial aid department, funny enough. Um, and I actually got a paycheck. Okay, so that's additional aid. There's also scholarship, which is not based on uh, citizenship status. It's based on um, transcripts or it's based on merit. It's based on essays. Um, you can definitely check with the different scholarship offices. And last but not least is um, federal student loans. We try not to encourage students to take out loans at a two-year college simply because there is so much other aid available. But we do understand if students um, need that additional support, loans are available. Loans do have to be repaid, though. So that is that caveat. So we always try to encourage to look at other aid before doing the uh, the loan. Okay. And that's pretty much all I have. And I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Awesome. We've got a lot of questions flowing in here. Okay. Um, and they're going to be all over the place. <laughs> okay. Okay. First one, um, I had somebody asking if the 529 funds will count as student assets. Yes. Okay. There you go. Um, I'm going to go back to a couple that had asked earlier. So um, Amy wanted to know when she could make changes to our FAFSA. I know that you mentioned it before, but maybe you could repeat it. It's usually three days after. I know they've been having issues with the FAFSA's applications to making corrections. They had told us February 2nd that they would be, students should be able to make a correction. So um, if you're still not being able to make a correction, my suggestion would be to um, either wait or call FAFSA. Um, if you want to call FAFSA, the best time to get them is in the morning. I've had students be lucky to get through to a live person in the morning. Uh, Amy's also asking, what does the number you receive after filling it out mean? So that's called, um, it used to be called the um, estimated family contribution. It's now called something else. That's basically a number that determines your eligibility. So the lower that number is, the more, el the more financial aid a student gets. So it's basically just a number that's used to determine what they qualify for. So let's say if the student has a zero, I believe it's an SAR uh, something like that. Um, <clears throat> if it's zero, that means they qualify for the maximum. If it's like 15,000, they're not going to qualify for anything but loans and possibly a fee waiver. Uh, Lillian asked if, what if parents don't remember the date that the parent became a legal resident? They would have to just ballpark it. Um, ballpark it as best as they can. They're not going to, you know, come, you know, saying, you know, at, knocking at the door saying this is incorrect but if you can just ballpark as best as you can okay. uh, db has asked um says you mentioned 50 50 custody for divorced parents if the child spends more time with one parent says 80 20 does the majority of the time parent file this only it's going to be whoever the student spends the most time with even if let's say that parent doesn't claim them on the taxes all the time maybe they stay alternated or whoever or maybe the other parent claims them on the taxes it's whoever the the child physically is with more of the time um another question by anonymous pell grant and cal grant is this for fafsa or california no ssn or a number student the pell grant is for students who are either a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. The Cal Grant can be either or. Both both sets qualify. If you have a social, uh, um, like you're a citizen or a resident, or let's say you're not a U.S. citizen, not a permanent resident, both can qualify for a Cal Grant. Uh, Lillian would like to know if she needs to fill out both the FAFSA and the DREAM Act. No, no. It's based on what is the student's um, citizenship status. Is the student, let's say the student's a U.S. citizen, but parents are not U.S. citizens, you're going to do the FAFSA application because it's based on what the student is. Um, somebody, Haiti, is asking, how do they know if the FAFSA got approved? So they're going to be getting an email from FAFSA. And again, like I said, right now, they're kind of in, there's been a lot of hiccups with, with the new rollout. 
Um, they're going to be getting an email letting them know what they've qualified for. FAFSA has, the Department of Education has let us financial aid uh, specialists know that we're not going to get the actual applications into our system until mid-March. <laughs> so you guys probably will not find out until mid-March. <laughs> Uh, anonymous would like to know what the Moore Park College ID number is to put on the FAFSA form. 007115. Can you repeat it one more time? Yes, ma'am. 007115. Charles would like to know if you can please tell us about the FAFSA changes. We have already submitted ours, but what should we expect? So basically, right, the changes are in how the how basically how the application was filled out so it's technically less less questions than it used to be um that's what's changed is how the FAFSA is filled out they still calculate the financial eligibility the same way as they used to uh calculate it um it's just that right now they're having a big um, issue with getting everything in because there's been a lot of hiccups with the FAFSA some people haven't even been able to get in and submit anything um, because it just it just spins. So the main difference is how it was filled out. Uh, Lisa said that her son completed the FAFSA at the end of December. When will we hear back on what financial aid we are qualified for? Mid March is the earliest is when is when the schools are going to get the information. Um, Dawn, that might answer yours also. She said, how long should FAFSA take? We submitted on 130. It's been five business days. So again, mid-March. Mid-March is when, is when the schools are going to get it. The students may get an email earlier, but with the way things are going, I highly doubt it. Okay. Um, Anonymous asks, what do we do if we already submitted a FAFSA and a parent did not make an ID and the form still hasn't been processed to be fixed? Um, so the parent has to do the ID. Um, and then that's the problem is that they weren't letting corrections be made. FAFSA said uh, February 2nd that was going to change where they were going to allow the corrections to be made. Um, has um, has the parent tried to go in now after they've made an ID and and signed it? That's that would, I think, be the next question to see. Okay. Um, Apple asked, what if the parent already completed a FAFSA app for themselves in the past? Would they use that FAFSA ID or would they have to create a new one? No, as long as you have an FSA ID, you use the same one, even if you used it for yourself. Um, Fran says that she has two children that will be applying. Do I, as a parent, use the same information ID on each of the applications? Yes. Um, anonymous said that halfway through filling out the parents section had to pause to get information. Now she can't get back in with the email and password. Yeah. So they're going to have to contact FAFSA to have it reset and FAFSA will not answer in the afternoon. So they're going to have to get on early in the morning. Okay. Um, anonymous would like to know where can they find the number that FAFSA gives you where you can see how much you will received. They probably haven't gotten that email yet because FAFSA hasn't processed anything yet. Um, that They'll probably get an email in mid-March. If they didn't see that number right away when it got when everything got submitted, um, then it's going to be mid-March is when they're going to see it. Okay. Um, another anonymous said, if student is not independent, do they essentially skip much of questions 19 through 29? Thank you. Yes. So basically it, the fast fold will, will basically guide them based on their answers. So if they answer no to everything, they're not homeless, they're not wards of court, it's not dangerous for them to be part of their parents, fast will automatically skip them. So I just showed you the PDF, which unfortunately went through everything site, you know, one by one, but it will skip it if the student doesn't qualify for it. <clears throat> Um, when a parent submits their section of the FAFSA, is it possible that the student's FAFSA also gets auto-submitted? Because that seems to have occurred in my situation, and this is Jose speaking. Yes, if this, especially if the student has finished their section, and let's say they did all their stuff, added their colleges, and then sent the link to the parent to, for the invite, and the parent did their section, then yes, it will automatically um, submit auto, you know, once the parent does their part. Um, this question is probably better for Alfonso or Laura, if one of you would like to come back on. 
Uh, Christine is asking, what would you say about the benefits of students starting their college career at a community college versus a four-year university? And of course, Anaisa, if you have an answer to this, you're welcome to jump in. Um, I think probably the easiest way to answer that question is it's, it's a very individual question. Um, obviously, there are a lot of financial benefits to going to community college, um, but you know, it really depends on the student, what they're looking for, their kind of experience. Um, as we've seen from this presentation, there are so many sources of financial aid. So we don't want that to deter anyone from going straight to a four-year school if that's where they believe, you know, they should be and that's the experience they want and they're prepared for that. So it really, I mean, Alfonso, I don't know if you would add anything to that, but I would say that's a really, really individual question. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Laura 100%. Definitely, that's a conversation you can have with your counselor on campus as well as one of the college and career counselors. That's where they're for is kind of to talk with you and find out what your plans are, what your goals are. And um, again, it, you know, every student has their own path and own direction that they want to go. And we're there to be able to support and help you find that way. So again, you know, we're here to help you guys. And I think um, interpreter Elizabeth has a question. Uh, yes. Um, how would you know if uh, you have been approved for Dreamers? So the Dreamers, it's going to be um, a lot easier because their application did not change. Um, what'll happen is right at the end, it'll tell them immediately what they, you know, it'll tell them their estimated family contribution. Um, and as long as it's submitted before April 2nd and they're in high school, they have a good shot of getting that, um, getting the Cal grant. Okay. So theirs is much more for, uh, straightforward because nothing changed for them. <laughs> um, Anonymous has said that my student filled this out and I submitted something in January. I received a thanks for consenting to keep your FAFSA submission moving. Am I finished? Who gets the email for offer, kid or parent or both? The kid, the student. The student's going to get the um, the email letting them know what they qualify for. Um, and like I said, that's probably going to be sometime in March. And is that the end of the submission process, that acknowledgement that she got or he got? Yes. Okay. Uh, when is the FAFSA due? So the FAFSA is technically due. So, okay. Let me rewind. It depends. If the student's going to a four-year, there's a hard deadline. And they have to check with each four-year school to see when that deadline is because it's different for each school. If the student's coming to a community college, we technically don't have a deadline, but we do encourage everybody to submit their FAFSA or DREAM application by April 2nd to have a, the best shot at getting their at getting the Cal grant awarded to them. Laura, Elizabeth. I'm also going to ask if under the new law, is there a deadline on our end that we need to make sure the students have applied? Uh, we are. Yeah, we actually, it's mandated by the state that all seniors apply for financial aid. So we are encouraging, supporting, offering resources so that that gets done. So we would like to see everybody do that um, by the end of the school year. So um, I know at our individual campuses and the others can chime in as well, we are offering you know workshops and we're available, of course, to help students, whether they need the DREAM Act or the FAFSA um, to get that done. And if they have a situation that they will not be filling out the FAFSA, then they need to talk to us about that and we'll take care of that. But it is an expectation that all seniors will fill out the FAFSA by the end of the year. Okay. Um, Brooke, um, I, we have Elizabeth who had a question. Oh, yes. Sorry, go ahead, Betsy. Um, if I didn't have all the information, can I, at the time I was filling it out, can I edit it? Yes. That information? Yes. Um, what's going to happen is... <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yes, they can go in and make a correction uh, to their dream application or their FAFSA application. If it's a FAFSA, it may be tricky because right now I don't know if they're letting corrections. They said after on February 2nd, they would be. So that was the last I've heard. So I'm hoping they can't. But if it's a dream application student, they should be able to go in right away. Uh, Brooklyn would like to know how to apply for the Moore Park Promise. Is that the same as FAFSA? Yes, it is. So in order to see if the student qualifies for a Moore Park Promise, you have to do a FAFSA application. 
we have to get it in and see that the student does not qualify for the California promise, which is the need-based one. Um, how the promise is um, calculated is every student gets what's called a budget. And that budget is their cost of attendance. Right now, I believe for um, dependent at-home budgets, it's like $15,000 um, or $13,000. let us say if based on parents' income and household size and assets, let's say that what's their estimated family contribution, which I'm using the old terminology because um, it's just ingrained in my head, let's say that's 15,000. Obviously 13 minus 15 is gonna put you in a negative. So at that point, if the student's in 12 units, the student would qualify for the Moore Park Promise. Let's say the budget's 13,000, but the estimated family contribution's 10,000. Then they would qualify, that student could qualify for the California Promise. So it just depends on what they qual on what their eligibility is. Uh, Christine uh, would like to know a recommendation for the best online resources to apply for college. She heard that college-wise is good. Maybe Laura or Alfonso can answer that one. Sure. And I, I don't know if Haley was getting kicked off, but Haley from Santa Sue is also here as well. Um, but um, for applying to college, um, it depends on which college you're applying for. There's um, unfortunately, there's not one way to do it. Um, so I would really, oops, I don't know if I got kicked off. Um, I would say, honestly, the best place to start is to have your child go see their, their counselor, their college and career counselor to figure out what schools they're applying to. And then you can go from there to figure out how do I apply? When is it due? What are all the pieces I need for that application? Because they are truly all different. So I would say that kind of helps them streamline, get organized. And we do use Naviance um, in senior year to help students get organized. So I would say that's your best bet. Um, and we are free. Yeah, it'd also be a good idea for them to, um, to go to the specific university's admission department and they'll be able to see how their application, whether um, they want them to apply directly to the institution or if there's another uh, platform that they'd like for them to use. Um, Anonymous is asking, I just want to confirm in the process of submitting forms and in the process of submitting forms and consented to tax information to be pulled, how do we know if that information was obtained? I no longer see the section to enter tax information from 2022. Yes, it, that's how it was obtained because you won't see it. it they're not going to show the student or the parent um, any of the tax information. Um, that way it limits having to put it put tax information in manually. Uh, Kelly would like to know the best, what school year is best for applying to FAFSA? Her son is a junior. So her son's a junior. So the soonest um, th that student would be able to do the FAFSA application would be 2526, which is for next year's August. Um, unless, unless that student is going to be having a high school diploma before this August, um, they, they would have to wait till next year, which would be 2526. Uh, Lillian would like to know if the 529 plan will decrease their eligibility for financial aid. It will because it's considered an asset. Okay. Um, Anonymous is asking, how does FAFSA work? Specifically, you said that schools won't get the FAFSA till mid-March. What happens then? The schools decide what the government is going to offer. So, yeah. So um, what will happen? We get the FAFSA in. And then we're going to basically be in a rush uh, to see what the student qualifies for as far as federal aid, because we won't know the Cal Grant eligibility until after the April 2nd deadline. After April 2nd closes, then we will get notified by the state probably a month or two later, letting us know, actually probably a month later, a month later, letting us know what students qualify for the Cal Grant. But we will know about the Pell Grant once we have the FAFSA in. Now, Here's a caveat. Every time a FAFSA is submitted, it, there's a random selection. One in four FAFSAs is selected for a random process called verification. Now, that will hold up awarding for the student, meaning FAFSA may ask for us to verify the taxes that the students and parents submitted. Um, so we may ask we are we may ask you to physically provide us with taxes. They may ask us to verify the student's identity. 
They may ask us to verify school, students' high school completion status. They may ask for everything. Okay, so it's just going to depend on FAFSA. I was one of those students that got selected every single year for four years. And then my classmate never once got selected. So it, it's just, it's a, it, it's unfortunately a luck of the draw. Um, Myra would like to know where the FAFSA form is located, how to access it. Uh, you can go to either studentaid.gov or I always, the fastest way I say is just go to fafsa.gov. It'll take you directly there because studentaid.gov takes you kind of all over the place. So just go to fafsa.gov. Um, Anonymous said that they started working in October 22, 2022, but they didn't file taxes. So what mm -hmm. do they do about the IRS form question? So it, it's going to ask them, did you file taxes? You're going to put no, because you did not make enough to file taxes. And then it's going to say, did you file um, a foreign return? You're going to say no. And then it's going to continue on. Um, Jose is coming back on. He had the question before about submitting. He said in his situation, the issue comes from the fact that the student hasn't put his signature on his FAFSA yet. We didn't know that his FAFSA gets auto submitted at the same time as the parents. Do you have any suggestions? If they can't log back into the FAFSA to make the correction, they're just going, they're going to have to keep trying to log in. Um, that's what I would say. The first thing to try to do is try to log into the FAFSA to see if they can make a correction. If it's available, because they told us February 2nd it would be. I, I don't know yet if it has been. Okay. Um, Anonymous said they sent in a form without a parent ID and submitted it in January. And it said it needed to be fixed. And we have to wait till it needs to be processed. However, the form is yet to be processed. Can we try to go online and create a parent ID now? Or do we need to wait to hear back from FAFSA? You can create the parent ID now. So that tells me then... Going back to Jose's question as well, that tells me they're not letting corrections be made yet. So you're going to have to go and create the FAFSA ID for parent and then keep checking to see if you see a link that says make FAFSA correction. Um, the next couple of questions are for my college team. Um, a Apple is asking if parents are able to set up a meeting with the um, financial aid rep on campus to assist with filling out the FAFSA just so we can be sure we do it correctly. I believe Apple is from uh, Simi Valley High School. And yes, definitely. You can set up an appointment with me uh, at any time in the College and Career Center. You can go ahead and go to our counseling website and you can see um, how to contact me. Best way is via email and I'll set up an appointment with you and we can go ahead and complete the FAFSA. And Laura is with Royal and Haley is with Santa Sue. <laughs> yes, and I just to um, Alfonso's answer is that um, there are many other resources. I don't know if Anaisa was maybe, I don't want to steal your thunder, but there are other resources as well um, uh, that are open and free to the public. The Cash for College workshops, there's one in uh, February, one in March, where um, you and your student can go there um, during the time frame and literally walk in. And it happens to be at Moore Park College, but it doesn't it's not dependent on you or your child going to Moore Park. They could be going to Boston College. They can go to this public service and it's totally free. So they can walk in, get help from a financial aid specialist, answer all your questions, do all of that. So that's a great option, especially if, if you want it to be a parent student type of meeting that's going through the FAFSA. That might be a good way to do it as well. We also have at Moore Park College, we have what's called a live assistance. Um, we have that Monday through Thursday, two times, um, 11 to 12, Monday through Thursday, and then one to three, Monday through Thursday. And then also um, from four to six on Tuesdays, all of these are Zoom. So you can jump on and we can assist you that way. And then I personally, um, I'm with Royal. So I personally am going to be on the campus as well at different times. Um, also for our team, uh, anonymous wants to know, does my student have to enroll in Moore Park again in the fall? If they're currently a dual enrollment student, <laughs> <I'll have to. laughs> it's a separate program. So you're starting all over again as a full, a full Moore Park college student. So yes, they're going to have to enroll and go through the process. 
And please make sure for that one, because that one, for some reason, whenever they apply after they do dual enrollment, they hit something and they classify themselves as not a, not an in-state student, which causes a whole mess. And I've seen a lot of that happen when they, then when they went over from dual enrollment to a regular student, I don't know what they hit. So be careful with that. Um, what if the FAFSA keeps kicking me out when I try to complete the parent section? Yep. That's what we're dealing with right now. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, they told us that there was going to be a re big reboot on the 2nd of February. It doesn't sound like there's been a big reboot. It seems like that's, there's still been issues. Um, so we're hoping to hear more from the Department of Education. Um, if they're make fixing my best, my best advice would be try different computers, different browsers, different times of the day. Okay. Um, uh we are coming down to the last couple of minutes, so I want to honor everybody's time. Um, somebody has asked, they already completed the FAFSA, Don did, um, for a four-year school that was requiring it by March 1st. Do they still receive it in time if there are delays with FAFSA right now? Yes, yes. As long as they hit submit, then it's just when we get the applications. So their school won't get the application till mid-March, but as long as it shows a submission date before the March 1st deadline, they should be fine. Anonymous wants to know how a student decides what school to go to without all of the financial aid options available until late April. Are all college dates to accept May 1st? That's unfortunately, there. It, it's going to have to be a, a big crunch for the students and parents to kind of unfortunately have their laundry list of what they want and to quickly look at everything because it's it's unfortunately when the when they told us when we're getting everything in. Um, anonymous said they. I'm so sorry. No, that's good. Go. Um, I just wasn't sure about my internet connection, so I apologize that I wasn't responding. But I did want to jump in that it it really is based on every campus and um like we've all kind of been saying that all of this is affecting everyone including the college campuses the changes that are taking place so all you can do is check back in on the status check in with your financial aid offices at the campuses that you're really interested in um but even just today i received an email from one college campus it was i believe in oregon about how typically they do have that may 1st uh, decision day and they had they had pushed it a little bit so some schools are pushing certain things but there's probably only so far they can push um so that's the reality of our situation right now so checking in with those campuses is really just the best that we um, can advise you to do right now yeah um somebody needs clarification they only need to apply for fafsa she doesn't he doesn't i don't know <laughs> anonymous doesn't need to apply separately for dream pell grant cal grant etc so the DREAM Act is a separate application. That's for students who are not a U.S. citizen, not a permanent resident. Um, so if the student's not a permanent resident or U.S. citizen, they do the DREAM application, which will apply for the fee waivers, like the California Promise or the Park Promise, and the Cal Grants. Um, if the student is a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, asylee, refugee, then they do the FAFSA that applies for the Pell Grant as well as the others. Okay. Um, Anonymous asked if the government looks at the checking and savings account amounts when determining what financial aid you are qualified for. They're going to look at all assets. So they're going to look at checking, savings, business, and investments. Okay. Last question. If my parents aren't married, do they both need to make an ID for FAFSA? Only one parent needs to do a, a FAFSA ID, but it's going to depend what the living situation is for the parents to determine who gets put on the FAFSA. Um, those are the, that's the end of our questions as I see them. Um, Susan, if you still have a question and want to type it in the Q and a real quickly, I, we don't do the, um, hands up, which you, both of you have a hand, I, the other one I've answered already, but, um, please take your hand down and instead give us the question in the Q and a, if you guys are okay for a moment, staying on. All right, looks like she's working on it. So while we're waiting for that, I just wanna thank you so much and maybe turn it over to Laura, Alfonso and Haley since this is really your show. Thank you, Jake. Thank you for um, for everything. Thank you, Anaisa, for all the wonderful information. And I think all three of us probably just wanna remind you guys about 
you know, what we have at our own campuses. So um, uh, like we said earlier, I'm from Royal and um, Anaisa is my financial aid specialist that comes to Royal. So we have um, two financial aid workshops offered every uh, month mm -hmm. um, up until that April deadline. So I encourage all seniors to sign up. The signups are in their Google Classroom. Um, and just, you know, continue to check email. Um, and like Haley just said, you know, be in touch with your colleges, check their financial aid sites, and please, please apply for scholarships. The Universal Scholarship is brand new out and open, and it's for Simi Valley seniors, and everyone should be applying. And I'll turn it over to uh, my other teammates. I got a quick question. Um, Julia wants to know if she has an S corporation. Is that an asset that is counted? An S corp. An S corp. So <clears throat> is it, it does it earn income? If it does earn income, then yes, it counts. It's counted as a business. Um, that seems to be it. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll so follow up and just say thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And if I, I can just remind everybody, <laughs> we will have this on um, the website in within the next week. So um, if you've got any questions, you can always email us until then. Um, and, wait, I think Haley and Alfonso wanted to say some closing <laughs> remarks there. Oh yeah, just just following what uh, Laura said at Santa Susana, just checking your email, checking the newsletter that goes out. We as well have um, a fin financial aid counselor from Moore Park College. You don't have to be attending Moore Park College to join in those workshops. We just had two last week. We'll have another later in February. So just keeping up with our newsletter to know when those dates are happening and checking email is really important because we do have a ton of different resources on campus. And then we're also encouraging students to look at those cash for college workshops off campus if they're unable to attend any of those. Um, yeah, and I saw someone ask about the Universal Scholarship. It has been sent out, um, shared on our newsletters, I know. And so that's just for our Simi Valley Unified Seniors. And we're really excited about all those local scholarship opportunities. So please take advantage of that or email your college and career counselor and we're going to help you out with that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, real quickly, I'll piggyback on, on the same thing my two colleagues were mentioning is that the events we have coming up, um, we are looking at having uh, Cal State Channel Islands come in and do a workshop a financial aid workshop at um, our campus as well as more Park College is, is providing services. Um, a lot of the universities have a lot of webinars that are set up right now because they understand that this year with the new FAFSA, it is difficult to navigate through. So um, definitely reach out to us. We're here to support you guys. We're here to help you so that we can make this process as smooth as possible. Um, if you guys have any questions, you know where to find us. Um, we have our newsletters. We have our s'mores. We have our emails. We have everything available and, and accessible to you. So again, thank you all for coming tonight. And I appreciate um, everything that you guys have that we, we provided for you tonight. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate. You know, we are. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, especially Betsy and Yvonne for jumping on and interpreting tonight. So <laughs> thank you, ladies. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.